Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today in our third virtual Inspire You in Perfect Harmony with New World Symphony. We encourage you to use the chat to submit any questions or comments. We will have a Q&A session at the end with all of our panelists. You will also be receiving a survey after the program where you will be able to share any feedback and suggestions for future events. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Sinner, CEO and Executive Med Medical Director of Miami Cancer Institute. Hi, I'm Mike Zinner, and welcome, uh, please, to this third annual uh, virtual Inspire You program. I'm Mike Zinner. I am the CEO and Executive Medical Director of Miami Cancer Institute. This series was created for patients, caregivers, and community members as a platform for inspirational and motivational guests to talk to us about the healing effects and what they have to do with cancer. Today, we have the privilege of hosting our community partner, New World Symphony, in a special presentation and musical performance. Miami Cancer Institute, part of Baptist Health South Florida, has partnered with New World Symphony to bring South Florida community discovery and innovation by intersecting the worlds of medicine, wellness, and music. Our partnership offers activities and experiences that provide families, students, teachers, adults, and seniors with engaging opportunities to learn about music, health, and wellness. Today's speaker, Ms. Stephanie Block, is a third year Viola Fellow and a pediatric cancer survivor. Stephanie expressed an interest in sharing her personal story with a rare pediatric cancer as a way of spreading a message of hope and perseverance. Stephanie has also used music to organize benefit concerts and visited numerous pediatric hospitals to educate and raise awareness. Stephanie's considered an exceptional talent and a virtuoso. She earned both her bachelor and master's degree in music from the Juilliard School. She's appeared as a soloist with several Chicago and New York based ensembles and is an award-winning chamber musician who holds a gold medal from the Fischoff National Chamber Music Competition. She's also an esteemed faculty member at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in their chamber music workshop. Today, Ms. Block is not only a cancer survivor and an advocate, but she's also a triathlete and an avid runner and a top finisher in the Chicago Triathlon. We are thrilled really thrilled to have Stephanie and several fellows from New World Symphony joining us virtually today. So at this time, please welcome Ms. Thank you, Dr. Zenner. Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm so happy to be here again presenting for Inspire You. I spoke for Inspire You my first year in Miami and was blown away by the incredible resources that the Miami Cancer Institute has. I was lucky enough to get a tour and see the beautiful building and the state-of-the-art facilities and this technology that just gives us so much hope for a cure. Although right now we're unable to visit places like hospitals, I am so happy that Miami Cancer Institute has chosen to give us this wonderful series. Thank you for having me again. So, suffice it to say that life looks a little different these days. Activities like going to the grocery store are met with anxiety. A hug from someone is something that many of us don't get, at least not very often. And for me, my life was full of rehearsals and busy schedules, stressful orchestral auditions, and occasional trips to the beach between rehearsals. Every day, I got up with a goal in mind, whether that was for an upcoming concert or for an audition that opened up for a spot that would get filled and possibly stay filled for the next 20 to 30 years. Right now, I'm alone here in the New World Center. I'm all alone in this empty but beautiful hall. This hall, a product of Frank Gehry, was designed with open spaces and lots of natural light. And the performance hall, where I am, is designed to adapt to a number of things. It can go from being a wedding venue to a dance floor to a concert hall in a matter of a few hours. Now it's empty, 
but the beauty remains and it adapts as we do. As Dr. Zinner mentioned, I'm a violist from the Chicago area, Barrington to be exact, and I attended Juilliard for both of my degrees. I started on the violin when I was four and realized my passion for being a performing artist and an intense one at that, when I was competitive with this boy in my middle school orchestra for first chair. Through that, I realized when I was 11 that I wanted to hold myself to a higher standard and that I wanted to do something that was demanding but worth it. And yes, I was incredibly precocious. If I could get that much joy out of my first orchestra, I had this gut feeling that maybe it was something I would do my whole life. I switched to viola at 13 after a period of trying new violins and realizing that I only liked the ones that sounded really deep. I found that viola was perfect for me. It held my intense type A personality and evened it out a little bit with its beautiful and full tones, and I've never gone back since. I ended up here at New World Symphony after Juilliard, and I have been so grateful from the day I moved here to Miami. I was born in May of 1994, a healthy baby. No complications. My mom went to the work to the, the day she had me. A few months into my life, my grandma discovered blood in my stool and some nasty rashes. Thus began a series of a lot of questions. The doctors at Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago were able to identify the disease by a skin rash, but it took several more weeks to determine the cause of my gastrointestinal problems. I was diagnosed with Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Langerhans cell histiocytosis is the most common of histiocytic disorders and occurs when the body accumulates too many immature Langerhans cells, a subset of the larger family of cells known as histiocytes. Langerhans cells are a type of white blood cell that normally help the body fight infection. In LCH, too many Langerhans cells are produced and build up in certain parts of the body where they can form tumors or damage your organs. The cause of this disease is unknown, although many possibilities have been explored, including viruses, exposure to toxins in the environment, family history, and geography. LCH is believed to occur in 1 in 200,000 children, but any age group can be affected, from infancy through adulthood. Researchers have recently classified it as a form of cancer. At the time, LCH occurrences in the GI tract, even among LCA patients, were really rare. By the time we were able to confirm the diagnosis, I was literally starving, unable to absorb any nutrition. So putting in the first IV needle was critical to my survival, but proved extremely difficult given my tiny size and my dehydrated state. It was frustrating trying to get to the source of the problem, going from one doctor to the next. When we finally confirmed LCH in the skin, I was too sick to get a biopsy of the GI tract to determine if it was LCH causing the bleeding and the inability to absorb nutrients. We were very fortunate to have a major research hospital close by. Children's Memorial Hospital had staff resident students to research the disease. And it was a resident that found one case where someone had LCH in the GI tract. Once we started treatment, my parents were hopeful as my initial response was positive, but it took 12 months of different forms of chemotherapy and steroids to fight the disease. I had to be monitored 24 seven by nurses. Of course, there was also the issue of being able to afford this care. My parents had to constantly fight with insurance companies about everything. There were many instances where they would threaten not to cover my treatment because it had not been approved by a pediatrician first. And this was largely due to the fact that nearly every time I was admitted to the hospital because of an infection, it was in the middle of the night. Issues like this made the fight more challenging as my parents were just trying to stay on top of everything. But eventually my parents were able to get the overnight nurse care so they could actually sleep. They found out later that those overnight nurses had been told that I wouldn't really make it past a few weeks. But I did. And it didn't matter what was said because no matter who was hopeful about me and who wasn't, my parents kept going. And they kept doing whatever they could to keep me alive, bravely charging ahead through every infection, every horrible side effect from the chemo, and every close call. It took a lot of resilience for them to keep going, aware of the possibility that I wouldn't make it, but staying above that darkness and moving forward anyway. A few months into the COVID-19 pandemic, 
This article on resilience came out in the New York Times, written by Eileen Zimmerman. In this article, she references a horrendous struggle in her life that resulted in the devastating loss of her ex-husband. She talks about how that time in her life prepared her well for this pandemic and social disturbance and economic uncertainty. She goes on to explain how an individual's resilience is determined by a combination of genetics, personal history, environment, and situational context. The genetics aspect is actually considered by researchers to be relatively small. Professor Karisten Conan, professor of psychiatric epidemiology at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, ex explains that it isn't true that some people are more born resilient than others. Almost any trait can be a positive or a negative, depending on the situation. More important is an individual's history. She says, quote, you can think of resilience as a set of skills that can be and often is learned. Part of the skill building comes from exposure to very difficult but manageable circumstances. In my case, this is due to the resilience of my doctors and my nurses and my parents. Dr. Elaine Morgan, who still works at Children's Memorial Hospital, has the grit and the determination of a superhero. She worked tirelessly over many months to make sure that I was getting the care that I needed. When there wasn't an answer, she worked until she found it. I have little to no memory of this disease. And so when I was sick, I didn't have any spiritual awakening about changing my life. The only reminders I have are teeth missing and dentures because of the chemo that rotted them and a few marks from the ports. So those are my only reminders now of what I fought. So I was, because I was less than a year old and didn't have any sort of awakening, I decided I had a choice in what I'd do with my life because I figure if I was strong enough to fight it, then I probably had the strength to do other hard things too. There are several tools, Zimmerman says, common to resilient people. One of these is optimism that is also realistic. Stephen Southwick, professor emeritus of psychi psychiatry, PTSD, and resilience at Yale University School of Medicine says, many, many resilient people learn to carefully accept what they can't change about a situation and then ask themselves what they can actually change. Conversely, banging your head against the wall and fretting endlessly about not being able to cope to change things Sorry, <laughs> fretting endlessly and not being able to change things has the opposite effect, lessening your ability to cope. My parents are the greatest example of this and are the part of the reason why I'm here at all. First, it took a while to get a diagnosis and the clock was ticking on my life. And there were other scary moments too. There's always a risk of infection when receiving chemotherapy and I ended up in the hospital within seven to 10 days of every treatment. However, one memorable visit, according to my parents, resulted in my platelets being so out of whack that I was bleeding uncontrollably from everywhere you could possibly imagine. At another visit, a nurse discovered early one morning that my entire body was stiff as a board. It turned out that someone mixing the overnight administered IV nutrition TPN had accidentally included too much potassium. My parents found me later that morning hooked up to oxygen. Thankfully, Dr. Morgan was notified of the occurrence and ordered around-the-clock monitoring, and there were no permanent effects. I think about that moment and how the weight of someone's world weighs on a healthcare worker every day, and right now we are especially reminded of that. I asked my mom if she ever thought I wouldn't make it, and she always just told me that she and my dad just didn't do much pausing to give into this possibility. They just kept going. They knew it might happen, but they put all of their energy into going and going until I was going to get better. My parents are the type of people who tend to keep their heads up with a steady demeanor. Growing up, I didn't always get this, and I would mistake this as not being concerned enough about something or misunderstanding me when I was anxious. And as a teenage girl, you do not want to be misunderstood. <laughs> now that I'm 26 and kind of starting to figure out my life, I'm starting to understand this kind of thing, and now I'm really thankful for it. I myself try to be an optimist. I'm often the one exclaiming out loud at a 
something like a beautiful sunset. Wow, isn't this so nice? Or wow, wasn't yesterday so great? Or wow, didn't that concert just make your entire week? And whatever I'm feeling, I'm bursting with gratitude. It's actually really hard for me to shut up about it. I just, I can't. And I always want someone to share it with. And don't get me wrong, that enthusiasm is definitely not always matched. I personally find it hard to not get bummed out when someone, for example, has to find reasons to immediately pick apart a performance when sometimes you just want to sit there and feel that it happened. This isn't to say that I never have anything bad to say or that I don't see room for improvement, but there are always going to be be people that bum you out. And I've always found that I like to try to go through life looking for the good as much as I can. Life looks a little bit more beautiful if you remind yourself of the little things that remain when everything seems to be going wrong. Another tool that Zimmerman mentions is a belief in something greater than yourself. Sometimes this is found through religious or spiritual practices, and it can also be part of a community and working towards the greater good of something. People who are resilient are altruistic and have concern for others, and they have a mission, a meaning, and a purpose. I mentioned before that the resilience and optimism I try to cultivate in my life are from the knowledge of knowing that I had the strength to fight histio. From any tough thing we face in our lives, we always have a choice in how we respond to it. So I figure if I was spared when I was that young, I should probably spend my life in a way that I can give back. In a manner very true to me, I wanted to take part in multiple community service projects at New World beginning my first year, including running my own, which normally during a normal season here, we're all quite busy. So it can take up a lot of time, but it reminds me of this quote from my master's graduation at Juilliard, where Wynton Marsalis said, how heavy something is depends on how you feel about carrying it. And that has really stuck with me because it just, it goes for so many things in your life. And in this case, I wanted to do everything I could and I wanted to get involved because I was so inspired by my colleagues. I wanted to be part of all of it. So the past two years, I was lucky enough to make monthly visits to the Sylvester Cancer Center and perform for patients, families, and doctors. The most special was getting to play in the inpatient and the chemotherapy units. Through doing this, I realized that I not only want to dedicate my life to being a performer, but equally to healing and research efforts. The chance to be up close and improve someone's day who is receiving their first chemo treatment or come play outside the room of someone who is unable to leave their bed is an experience I would never trade. I've had many special moments in these hospital visits, and I really miss them. I've seen lively doctors on their 20th hour of work make a song request and light up when we pulled it up on our iPads and played some Annie Lennox. I remember last December playing outside the door of a sick patient who was on contact precaution. I remember getting the call on Christmas Day, just a few days later, that this wonderful man had passed away. And I thought about the fact that the last live music he heard came from me and my colleague, Kevin. That will always stay with me. Even after we could not visit hospitals anymore once the pandemic started, some fellows and I continued to play on Zoom calls for patients and doctors who wanted to tune in. And I promised myself when I was a teenager that I would do something good with my music to give back because I was one of the lucky ones. It's in these moments where these passions that I feel that I have and that many others have are taking the spotlight during this time. We're being called now more than ever to use our music as a force for good and for healing and for hope. I wish I could tell you that I possess this superwoman strength because I had cancer and fought it. There's no doubt my body being ended up being strong enough, but it took the work of many to keep me alive as well. I get reminders of this every so often when I see posts pop up in the LCH Awareness Facebook group tiny little kids with nasty rashes or wounds because they kept ripping out their central line. I did this all the time. I ended up with socks on my hands and tubes uh, taped to me because I kept ripping out my line. And I think my parents were quite tired of having to feed it through my nose or put it back in. 
I'm sure it was awful. Having an infant to begin with is a lot of work. And then dealing with that, I'm sure was not fun. <laughs> I see how scared and confused the parents are on these posts. And because histiocytosis has far less research done and far less funding for that research, many are left with questions. But I also see in some posts how excited the parents are when their kids finish their last round of chemo and have made it through. And I think of the pink Barbie Jeep that my dad got me when I was three years old for having gone through dental surgeries and insane toothaches that I didn't understand. Of course, now I know what they're from. But those memories are really special to me. And it just reminds me of just how amazing my parents were through all of this. The last tool mentioned in this article is a social support system. Very few resilient people go it alone. Sometimes we can see it as a sign of weakness for, to ask for help. I found myself fluctuating between wanting to pretend I can do it all and knowing that I should reach out for help. And sometimes I wait until I just can't do something anymore and I'm finally giving myself permission to break down and ask someone else for help. And sometimes we're met with people who are not kind to this vulnerability a sensitive person myself, sometimes it takes me a little longer to get up when I'm broken down. But at the end of the day, I can hope that my attention to someone's vulnerability will help them. I, like anyone else, have not moved forward in my life without some help. It's true that the final decision to improve or change comes from within us, but it often takes the kind word of a friend who really understands what you're feeling or offers a fresh perspective that can mean the difference between you spending another hour in bed watching Netflix or deciding to put your pants on and go outside. Not that there's anything wrong with watching Netflix in your bed, but it's not great to do all the time, probably. Dr. Zinner mentioned also that I'm a triathlete. When I was nine years old, my dad just signed me up for a triathlon. I didn't ask to do it from what I remember, but I was a kid, so I couldn't really say no, and I figured, why not? I wasn't a good runner or anything. In fifth grade, I finished last in every track meet. I did, however, grow up watching my parents in countless races and felt the excitement and relief of someone having completed a tough job. I don't remember a ton about when I was nine years old, but I do remember how awesome it felt to do something that tested my mental and physical strength. And I got totally hooked. I was still a kid though, so the concept of dedicated training was very much lost on me. <laughs> I would do these races with virtually no preparation, and it was honestly felt terrible in the moment, but I still had fun. And we would always get ice cream after, and it was great. Eventually, I started to train more because I realized that if I actually trained, it would be less painful and I wouldn't have to be in another race where they started packing up the finish line before I was finished. Yes, that happened. It was really embarrassing. <laughs> Eventually, I started to see myself do kind of well. A particularly proud day was when my entire family was there at the Chicago Super Sprint Triathlon and I finally won my age group and I was so excited to get on the podium and have my little moment, but we needed to leave for New York that day because I was starting my freshman orientation, but it was still a great moment. <laughs> and being a triathlete and a runner is a core part of who I am now. Some funny things have happened in these races that have certainly tested that mental strength. <laughs> A particularly funny time was actually my first year here at New World. I competed in the South Beach Triathlon. It was a windy but a beautiful day in April. And I had mostly trained in a pool, so it was a lot of fun for me and everyone else to be thrown around by giant six-foot waves during the swim portion of the race. That was a really long 15 minutes. <laughs> After getting nice and dehydrated by swallowing way too much salt water, the bike portion was also something really special. It was a 20-mile course, up and down 195 and up and down MacArthur Causeway, with the middle portion through Wynwood. Around the time I got to Wynwood, my butt was killing me, like so painful, like the kind of pain where you've never been on a bike before, and I felt like I had zero strength as I was pushing up the causeways. Those inclines felt really terrible, and I can confirm to you it's a lot more fun to drive up them than to bike up them. <laughs> so on the way back on MacArthur, I was on the last few miles of the race, 
I realized part of the reason I was struggling so much was because my bike was not responding. And mind you, I was already having a mental breakdown on the course. The derailleur hanger on my bike snapped off right around the point where you see the cruise ships. I shouted a lot of expletives, realized there was a tourist family behind me, and they gave me water because they saw how distressed I was. And I kind of just stood there, not sure what to do. It was too bad that's not where the cameras were because that would have been a great photo op. They had snapped my picture a couple minutes before this happened. So missed opportunity. I was letting out a lot on the course that day. A breakup, additional frustration that I was supposed to carry my heavy bike and for, for the next few miles. <laughs> and I was thinking, there is no freaking way that I'm not finishing this race. I don't care if I'm dead last, I need to do this for myself. And I knew that I had friends waiting for me on the run course and I couldn't let them down either. I needed to just do it. I finally found someone a mile later who could reset the chain so I could run the last mile or two with my bike. A lot of people were giving me weird looks asking why I was running with my bike. But if I left it somewhere, I would have been disqualified. The run portion was the only thing that didn't go horribly wrong. And my friends were there on the run course, and I was so happy to see them. <laughs> that was half my motivation, really. And it was all worth it in the end. Baptist is an amazing partner of New World Symphony and sponsors fellows to run the Miami Marathon every year. I did the half marathon back in February with several other fellows. That was also not without a prime moment. Also on MacArthur Causeway, where at mile two, I had some sort of muscle spasm in my left leg and kind of limped my way through the next few miles. I texted someone at New World, which is around mile eight, that I probably wouldn't finish. And I was taking over the New World Instagram that day. But I kept going. And thankfully, I, something happened and my legs started to respond or I started changing the way I was running. And I made it through the race and I proved myself wrong. And I actually ended up beating my PR from five years ago. Plus, anyone watching my takeover would have really missed my ugly mile 12 selfie. So I really, I had sufficient motivation. <laughs> These are not monumental struggles. They're mostly just kind of funny inconveniences that have happened to me that I'm sure people think I'm making up for dramatic effect. But nonetheless, they mean as much to me as struggling with the future of my career during a pandemic or fighting a childhood cancer. They all come from the same resilience and grit that we all possess. It's just a matter of how much of it we need to summon to get through the next hurdle. I am so lucky. I recognize my privilege as a white, straight female, as someone who was raised in a good family and one, who was always, one that has always looked out for me and didn't question my decision to become a musician. I'm lucky to have the beautiful instrument that I do, to have lived in amazing places like Chicago, New York, and Miami. And as a classical musician, I see how privilege plays a huge role in classical music. One needs access to good education, opportunities to be seen and to be heard, and the chance to play on an instrument that will reflect your ability as an artist. And outside of the general amazing privilege of being a classical musician, there's of course the aspect of competition. For those of us choosing to go the orchestral route, we wait every month for an opening for a job in the International Musician magazine. And at most, a few hundred people will audition for one spot, and maybe multiple spots will be open if you're a string player and it, you're really lucky that a bunch of people retired that year. And we spend years, of course, on our instruments, becoming great in instrumentalists, but that actually doesn't begin to cover the amount of months or years some of us will spend learning how to take auditions. A crazy amount of mental and physical strength goes into that time where you step on a stage that you've never played on before, or it's super cold backstage, or you're stuck in a warm-up room with a bunch of people who sound exactly like you do or better, and of course, it's impossible not to compare, because they all had the generally the same level of education. We're all coming from really amazing places. And this is like the great equalizer when you get behind that screen and you have 10 minutes to make an impression. Sometimes it's not 10 minutes. Sometimes it's like two minutes. And truth be told, many of these impressions can be made in the first 10 to 20 seconds about your playing. So these people know exactly what to listen to. 
But people in the greatest orchestras have taken, sometimes taken 30 auditions before they've won something. It doesn't matter. You only have to win one to get a job. Some of it's luck. And a lot of it is learning how to not crack under the pressure and how to play the mental game. Well, unfortunately for most musicians right now, especially in the United States, those jobs that people have been overjoyed to finally win have been halted. Some orchestras were forced to lay off their musicians for an entire year or more. Some have had to take pay cuts. This is a devastating time for the performing arts. Until it's safe again, Broadway, operas, orchestras, dance, anything, you name it, is put on hold. But thanks to incredible technology, some of us, like me, are able to be supported by our organizations and reach audiences in other ways. Right now is a particular instance. These performances you're going to hear were pre-recorded and put together by our incredible audio and video team so that I could share the most special experience possible with you. When everything shut back down back in the spring, our artistic director, Michael Tilson Thomas, sent us an email a few months into the pandemic. We were all really worried about what our futures would be in the coming year, not to mention the fear of having a career in general in the, career, in the future of classical music. Michael remarked on a conversation with Frank Gehry, saying that this is what New World is about, adapting and looking to the future. Frank remarked, when old models fall apart, that is the moment for new invention. I'll leave you with a story of a stuffed clown. <laughs> I was walking down a snowy street in December of 2013 in St. Joseph, Michigan with my Aunt Kathy. She has many stories from when I was sick and constantly in the hospital. She was around a lot. She was probably the person who was there the most after my parents. She told me a story about this stuffed clown that I had when I was sick. Aunt Kathy was spending tons of time with me, and I was getting really sick from all the chemo treatments. And she told me about how she would wave this clown at me to distract me for a second from what was really going on. And according to her, I was really entertained by the clown, and I would start laughing a lot whenever she waved it in my face. A few seconds later, I'd have to go throw up. But right after, I'd turn my attention back to the clown and start laughing again. Lean over, throw up, laugh at the clown. Repeat many times. <laughs> That story made me laugh because although I don't remember it, it meant a lot to hear the kind of strength that she saw in me even as a kid. It might seem really simple, but to me it actually means everything that she told me that. I figured if I could lean over, puke, and continue laughing, that there had to be some way I could do that now. To this day, when I want to give up on something, I try to think of the little clown. The pain of the constant puking was temporary but the joy I got from the clown would stay. Although that image is kind of graphic, and I apologize, <laughs> this just reminds me that life is full of moments where you sometimes lean over and have to let out the crappy stuff. Sometimes it lasts a little bit, and sometimes it lasts a really long time. But that grit is always there within us. What keeps me going is the thankfulness that I feel that I chose a career that makes me feel love and passion like I've never felt. I remember being on stage here, my first subscription concert with MTT, and we played Brahms 4, and I just remember thinking, I don't know if I can love almost anything as much as I love this. So when it comes back, it'll be worth it. I, like everyone else, have been pushed to moments where I felt helpless, weak, and scared. And during a time like we are all experiencing, that is happening daily, at least on some level. There is so much bravery in the world. So take the strength that you see, stand up, and go, because the world is waiting for you. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce my colleagues, Dylan Welch, 
Michael Rao, and Claire Bradford. They performed with me on this program that we recorded a few days ago, and I am so honored and so lucky that they took the time to do this with me and that they are here today. Dylan will be introducing the first piece. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm actually going to be introducing the first three pieces. We're going to perform them as a set. Um, they were all pieces that were arranged um, by the Danish String Quartet. Uh, they've been doing a lot of this over the past several years of taking lots of folk tunes um, and dances from Scandinavia mainly, but also um, some other parts of like Northern Europe uh, and arranging them into these really delightful uh, uh, arrangements, I guess. Um, and the three pieces that we're gonna play for you today are all from uh, their album Last Leaf that came out a few years ago. And I urge you, if you really like what you hear today to go check out that album, because it's got these pieces on it and it's got a bunch of other pieces that are really, really cool. Uh, I love the album, it's great. So the first thing we're going to play is a minuet, uh, a Danish traditional minuet. The minuet, of course, is a, a courtly dance in three quarters time that originated um, in France in the 1600s and was popular in the 1700s and to some extent the 1800s as well. And it spread all across uh, Europe. Um, there's not much to say about that one, but uh, that's, that's a, a nice, pleasant piece. Uh, and then we'll go into the Unst Boat Song. And this one's a little more interesting. Uh, I only recently learned from a friend who's actually watching this today. Um, Unst is the northernmost island in the Shetlands, the Shetlands being the island chain to the northeast of the northern tip of Scotland. They're pretty far up there. They belong to Scotland and the UK, but a long time ago belonged more to Norway, which is from the island of Unst, less than 200 miles away, the western coast of Norway is. And this boat song has been passed down for hundreds of years. Uh, we don't really know much about what the words of the song are. You're not going to hear the words of the song, but uh, because they're in Old Norse, it's been kind of hard to uh, completely translate them. Uh, but we do know that it's uh, mainly a song about, you know, prayers for uh, safe travels on the water, on the ocean, and prayers for a safe homecoming for uh, the sailors that lived on the island of Unst. And then uh, we'll wrap up the set with uh, a piece called The Dromer, which is really exciting. That was a, uh, a, a Scottish reel that was discovered in an 18th century Danish tune collection. And it's a very exciting, it's kind of like fiddly. You know, I, I've got, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be the first violin on that. And uh, just from the get go, to play this exciting fiddle tune that kind of goes throughout the piece. And because it was an arrangement by the Danish String Quartet, there's also uh, a bit of a mashup of some other tunes in there, including towards the end, what we will have heard right before the drummer, the Unst Boat Song, which will be juxtaposed with the theme of the drummer. And that boat song theme will be played by our second violinist, Mike. So. These are really fun. We had a lot of fun working on them and I hope you enjoy them. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dylan, for, for introducing those. Those were so much fun to play. The Danish string quartet pieces I was introduced to by my friend Drew, who was a cello fellow here at New World, and they're just they're just the best. You just never get tired of them. So I'm so glad that we could play those together. Next is my performance of the Chacon from J.S. Bach's Partita Number no. 2 in D minor. This is a violin partita in D minor. This has become the most famous of Bach's six works for unaccompanied violin, and it concludes with Chacon, which is one of the crown jewels of the violin literature and has been arranged for several other instruments, including viola. The Chacon offers some of the most intense music Bach ever wrote, and it's worked its spell on musicians everywhere for the last two and a half centuries. This makes Bach's Chacon sound ex like extremely cerebral music, and, and it is, but it also manages to be so expressive at the same time. This four-bar ba ground bass repeats 64 times during the piece, and at the center section, Bach moves into a D major section, and the music relaxes a little, sings, sings happily for a while, and kind of reminds me of a sun rising in the middle of so much turmoil and pain. And after a while, the calm nobility returns to the D minor section, and it concludes at this amazing uh, arrival. I fell in love with this piece a while ago, and I felt it was reflective of a noble struggle, but with a glimpse of sunlight and hope. So I hope you enjoy. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Wow, thank you so much, Steph. That was amazing. Um, speaking as someone who's um, played that piece before, it's such an incredible journey and such a workout to play. And that was just so inspirational. Um, really happy that you were able to share that with all of us. Um, we're going to conclude this program today with um, one of my favorite pieces. It is the Cavatina from Beethoven's String Quartet. Uh, Opus 130. This was written in 1826, which is one year before Beethoven died. So definitely towards the end of his life. Um, this movement is the fifth movement of six. And it's really the emotional heart of this piece. It's just so beautiful and intimate. Um, and it, it sounds sort of like two um, singers um, playing together and singing together. Um, it's really incredible. And uh, one interesting thing about it, and I think it's fitting that it ends this program is, this is the last piece included on the Voyager golden record, which is the phonograph record that went out into outer space in 1977 with the two unmanned Voyager probes. This is the very last piece on that record. So it really just encapsulates the whole human experience. Uh, we hope you enjoy this.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Dr. Zinner, if you'd like to come on, uh, we're going to, we have time for some questions now, and he'll be leading that. And Claire, Dylan, and Mike, if you could come back for that, that would be great. So, Stephanie, thank you. You're not only a beautiful musician, a beautiful young woman, a wonderful and inspiring storyteller, but if you decide to have a second career, you could be a media personality. Terrific, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, I, and I wanna thank Dylan and Michael and Claire also. But, but, let, but before we begin some of the questions and answers, let me read a couple of comments, please, to, to you, Stephanie, that echo the same thing. Thank you, Stephanie, for such a wonderful example of resilience and not giving up. Thank you for the beautiful performance and much needed food for the soul. God bless you. And another, Stephanie, your tenacity and willingness to give of yourself is so inspiring to all of us. Thank you for sharing your story and showing us your vulnerability, yet you kept moving on. God bless you. Another, thank you for sharing, Stephanie. You speak beautifully and you're able to intertwine with current events and express yourself through music, at, which is a personal favorite of theirs. So I, I echo their comments. It was wonderful and inspiring and fits so perfectly in what we had hoped to accomplish here in the Inspire You part. Now, now let me ask you first, Stephanie, a couple of questions that have come in. And then I, I'm gonna ask a couple of the panelists the questions. So a very common question. What advice would you give to someone who wants to start a career as a musician? <laughs> we were joking earlier that the answer to that be, would be don't. But <laughs> no, it's, uh, you know, I think if you're going to be a musician, it's, first of all, there are so many ways to be a musician for your career. But uh, if you want to have a life in music, I mean, the first thing is that, you know, just make sure that you really love it because the love for it is going to get you through a lot of difficult days. And I think the other piece of advice I would give, especially to someone who's just starting out and becoming serious, is to just become familiar with the feeling of uh, discipline, personal discipline, because a lot of what we do is self-directed. And I've had to learn many hard lessons about uh my own preparation and my own uh, grace in failure and um, to just know that that's a big part of it, but that it's so worth it. So, so I, I'd like to ask now the, the panelists and I'd like to ask in order if you, each of you could answer first Stephanie and then Dylan and then Michael and then Claire, a, pa a question came in is there an orchestral piece that made you fall in love with being a musician or a solo piece? And, and for Stephanie and then Dylan and then Michael and then Claire. There are a lot for me, but I think one in particular that really made me fall in love with being a musician and really solidified the fact that I wanted to do this was um, Mahler's Fifth Symphony. And all of the Mahler symphonies are ridiculously beautiful and amazing. And uh, I got to play Mahler Five in high school, my sophomore year. And it's a monster of a piece. It's a really tiring 75 minutes, but it's every moment is just beautiful. And when you see if there's music like that, it's, it's just incredible. So that was definitely one of the things that just reminded me that I want to do this for my life. Dylan and Michael and Claire? Uh, yeah, so I actually, you know, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, so I would actually instead say that there is a particular experience that I had that kind of put me on the track to what I'm doing now. I've been playing the violin since 1997. I started when I was five years old. I've been playing a long time and I always thought I wanted to do something in music, but I I definitely thought that, you know, I was just kind of doing it to do it sometimes. And by the time I'd gotten to ninth grade, I was having 
for the first time, serious doubts about whether this was the path that I wanted to go down. I thought that, you know, I was having a string of bad performances that were mostly motivated by nerves. And I just wasn't sure if it was worth it for me. And when I was in ninth grade, I got to be participate in uh, my state's all state orchestra from Washington State. And uh, it was conducted by Gerard Schwartz, who at the time was the conductor of the Seattle Symphony and is now the music director of the orchestra at the Frost School of Music, University of Miami. And uh, we had a great time. I got in ninth grade, I got selected to be second chair, which was amazing. And after we performed, he, uh, Mr. Schwartz, uh, invited all of us to come to Seattle a couple months later and do a side by side with the Seattle Symphony. And um, I got to go, we played the same program, which were some of the movements of The Planets by Gustav Holst and the last movement of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. So I guess those were pretty formative pieces in themselves because the experience itself, getting to play in Benaroya Hall in Seattle, which is this amazing hall with uh, these amazing musicians, the best orchestral experience I'd ever had. Um, I remember coming away from it thinking, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could come to work every day and do this, play an orchestra? And I think from that point forward, you know, back in 2007, I've never wavered from that. I've, I always wanted to be an orchestra and it really drove me to kind of select the, the path that I wanted, uh, you know, post high school in, you know, undergraduate where I went to school and, and, and grad school and coming down here to the New World Symphony where I've now been for over three years. So it was a really wonderful experience that I think I will always remember was like the spark, the moment that I knew that this is what I wanted to do, play an orchestra for the rest of my life. Um, <clears throat> for me, I think the first orchestral piece, um, I had been playing, you know, the violin and, you know, playing a lot of solo pieces and that sort of thing, but the very first orchestral piece that really affected me and made me, you know, really take an interest in orchestra was probably um, Rimsky-Korsakov's Scheherazade. Um, anyone who's ever heard this piece knows just what a wonderful display of the orchestra it really is. Um, you know, all the different colors that can be featured and all the different moods and emotion the orchestra can capture. And I just, I remember um, just really wanting to be a part of that because um, it's just something that you can't accomplish by yourself. That's one of the great things about playing an orchestra is um, it's greater than the sum of its parts. So um, I think that would be my piece. Thanks, Claire. So for me, my very first uh, draw to music was Yo-Yo Ma's recording of the first Bach cello suite. I was raised listening to classical music and I just like, there was something about the box suites that were just so, so, so beautiful to me. And the sound of the cello was so incredible to, incredible to me. And it just, it moved me. And I was four years old and somehow knew that this was something that I wanted to try to do. Um, and obviously, you know, that I was too young to know that that was when I was going to be, you know, choosing what would end up being a lifelong career in music. Um, I think that moment for me was, um, a performance at, uh, with the Pittsburgh Symphony of Yo-Yo Ma playing, once again, Yo-Yo Ma <laughs> playing um, the Dvorak Cello Concerto. And like by the end of the piece, I mean, the climax of the piece in the last movement is emotional and moving. And I think most of the audience was in tears as was what seemed like some of the orchestra. And at the end of the concert, the whole cello section was hugging one another and Yo-Yo was going and giving kisses and hugging everyone. And it was this amazing moment of community that just really, I think solidified what I knew, which was that we could all share something that was so beyond us and so beautiful and have moments of human experience that you can't really describe and you can't really touch, but you just live for every time you go out on stage. Well, we're, we're, we're close to the end of the, of the time we have. And I, I just wanted to share with uh, all of you that there are multiple comments that have come through thanking you, all of you, for your contributions and the unique way that we can weave the beauty of music and the health of our environment. And all of you have contributed magnificently that, to that today. 
And Stephanie, helping us organize this, we thank you very, very much. As I said to all of you, we are grateful for the experience that we shared and look forward to many more of these here in South Florida. You all bring greater sunshine during a difficult, very difficult period in all of our lives. And so I'm afraid I'm going to have to end because we are running out of time. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. And uh, from us at the Miami Cancer Institute, we're here also to help lives get better. And thank you all, we'll, we'll sign off from here.